Welcome back to the Acoustic Shop channel. We are here today with our great friend Marcel from LessonsWithMarcel.com. Uh, <laughs> glad to have you with us. We're going to be, you like that dot com add on right it. there? Pretty good at it. I'm, I'm pretty good at that. We're going to be talking about our favorite accessories today, what it is we think everybody should have, and maybe even some things we think you probably shouldn't have. It's going to be a whole bunch of fun. We'll do that right after this. Well, here we are again, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is going to be a whole bunch of fun. Uh, before we get into the crazy stuff, again, I'd love to invite you guys, if you have not yet done so, please do the old like and subscribe. Uh, this is uh, actually mandatory stuff, in case you didn't already know this, Marcel. Uh, you have to do this for every video. Please like and subscribe, comment, thumbs up, ring the bell. I'm, I'm learning so much about things. YouTube. <laughs> I figured you were. I figured you were getting your chance here. So anyway, and while you're at it, make sure to check out lessons by uh, lessons with Marcel. Uh, so many cool things over there, Marcel. So glad to have you here today. Glad this to be This is going to be a whole bunch of fun. We're going to talk about our favorite uh, accessories for flat pick guitar, and uh, you know, I think you probably have a couple of favorites. Maybe one. Too. I do. Let's get into it. Let's start with picks. Yeah, guitar picks. All right. We can start with picks. I'm down with picks. Uh, what are you using right now? What is your favorite go-to pick uh, for flat pick guitar? This is tough. You put me on the spot. I, I will have to say <laughs> the tone slab, um, which is in? which is new. We were just talking about the tone slabs. Um, they're I think they're an acrylic material. Am I wrong? You're the retailer here. It is a type. He told me, was, I, I was told it was a bilemer. I don't know what a bi, I think it's different than a polymer. I, that's just, just two. I, bi, they're being yeah. top, they're, yeah, it's, they're, they're being top secret about this stuff. Um, but I'm gonna have to agree with you. I have my tone slab here as well. So uh, tell us what you love about the tone slab. The tone slab is really interesting. Um, it has a, it has this really like interesting attack to it. So your playing sounds very clear because this, uh, I even described it as almost like a vague clicking sound. I know that's a negative. We normally don't want clicking sounds, but you just get it's such a nice attack on the note that that's the only way I can describe it. Uh, but the notes sound very clear. Um, I haven't played mine long enough to get any real wear on it. And you were telling me that it takes a little maintenance like a shell pick might. It does. It does. I would not say it's as much as a shell pick. So... For those of you, again, who are uh, new to the flat picking world or even those of you who have been around for a long time, I think we kind of created a standard for most flat pickers, which was tortoiseshell is king. All of our big heroes uh, from generations past were big into the tortoiseshell sound uh, as, you know, and there was there always was. I got I, I have to admit, I have always been a tortoiseshell fan. Uh, that's what I played for many, many years. I still have a good collection of tortoiseshell, um, but there was a definite maintenance issue with tortoise. And the big thing was mm -hmm. when you played hard with it, it would chip. It also wear and start to get scratchy and, and do some kind of funny things. So there was always a continual reshaping and buffing out of tortoiseshell picks. Um, and then for for my entire playing career, there was always a company that was coming out. This is better or as good as tortoiseshell. It's yep. always going to be there. I never, ever agreed with that. I just never bought that hype. The closest I had got to, which was before this, which was the blue chip pick. And I'm sure, I'm sure you probably were a blue chip fan as well. Did you play those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a couple blue think, chips right here. <laughs> I think this was, yeah, I think this was my closest. I got a couple of sin in here too as well. Uh, you know, one right here. Uh, <laughs> This was my closest uh, thing that got there. My argument always was that it didn't quite sound the same, and uh, most of it was that attack on the front side. Um, but I was willing to give that up in the fact that they were maintenance, pretty well maintenance-free. Um, I never really ever had any issues having to work on them and shape it. And for me, the difference was like, boy, that's, a, that's enough of a value. I'm good with that. You know, there's probably one person in the comments that's going to say, oh, I wore down a blue chip, but I hear that so rarely. You know, like yes. once in a blue moon, someone says, oh, I actually changed the shape of a blue chip. But you can play these forever and they will never change shape. <laughs> they will just they stay the same. They don't seem to at all. 
It's remarkable. Yeah. I, um, I would agree with that. Now, I've been playing my Tone Slab since September, so what, uh, five, six months now? Um, I do... I don't think I have reshaped it uh, in the playing, but I definitely start to get that wear, uh, a little bit of a scratchy side to it. So I do think there is some maintenance there. It does have to be buffed again and redone on those slick sides. That's what, there's my opinion on the maintenance side, so. Yeah, if you have experience with that too, um, I don't I don't imagine that the wear would be the same as like, maybe like a casein pick, you know, where you get like the ripples yes. when they wear. Mm -hmm. um, you get that in tortoiseshell sometimes too, but it, it seems like the the tone slabs. Maybe you could tell me if I'm wrong, but would wear in a little bit more of a linear fashion. I, they seem to be so far for me. Uh, that's what I would agree. So I do agree with you. I think there is some more maintenance in it. I don't think it's n near anywhere near. I have yet to see any chipping. I have yet to see any heavy wear. It's just mainly just that rebuffing, uh, just to keep a slick, smooth surface uh, for the tone. You know, because most of us play with a forward or backward angle to it and kind of wear against the grain of, you know, how that whatever material has been laid and it can get a little bit scratchy in that manner. Well, well, I hit, hit a lick with that tone slap so all the tone nerds can have a knock. Now that's pretty cool. I actually, you know, this is pretty fun. I actually had, uh, I do have one piece of tortoise here that's sitting here. Uh, same shape, same overall size. So for me, that's pretty darn close. I don't know, you know, depends on your audio, what you like, but definitely a difference uh, from some, but to me it's pretty close. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I agree. So, um, yeah, if you're keeping score, buy a blue, blue chip or buy a tone slab. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's your your best options out there right now. Um, uh, now, Gage, I, I, I'm curious, uh, where, where are you on the Gage side of both of those two picks, just so everybody knows? Yeah, um, I play a 1.5. 1.5. I am working a 1.3. Um, by the way, this is a, an Acoustic Shop exclusive color, by the way. Uh, this Ooh. little turquoise blue. Yeah, it's pretty special. Um, but this is a <laughs> 1.3 in their uh, XL three round. I'm a rounded corners, and I do like that uh, slightly bigger. Or the TAD 3R. We I have one of those in a 55 that uh, that I had them build for me. That's what I do. That's funny. Like. I play the, the TAD and the XL, too. I just don't have a rounded side. Yeah, yeah see? There you go. I, that's because you want clean notes. I want mine to be less clean. So that just works. you don't want anyone to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's probably our pick for uh, a pick that's on the uh, more expensive side or the ultimate pick. Let's say you're on a budget. What do you recommend? What's your favorite? You know, standard pick out of the, you know, out of the out of the basic guitar store style pick. What do you What do you think is the best thing for that person? Probably the fake blue chip, the prime tone. <laughs> the prime tone, yes. I'd agree with that. I like that one. Uh, I personally like it better in the non-grippy side. Uh, you can do that. Uh, definitely does not wear. It wears a lot faster than uh, the blue chip one does, but a very you similar not, guitar tone. You might not find them in, in guitar shops, but there's also uh, Wigan picks, which, which are a little bit yep. more affordable, right? They're quite a bit more affordable. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, they're gonna be. I think they're a little bit more than the prime tones, less than I don't That's right. remember. I know they come in a, pa a package, uh, and then I, up until then, back in the old days, I still was a uh, Delrin fan. I was running about a, I think it's a one point two uh, millimeter pick. Again, if you're just going mm -hmm. for the thirty five cent style pick, that's probably what I'd say in between the blue and the purple. That's probably my favorites. <laughs> All right, Agreed? what about capos? All right, capos. All right, let's uh, let's go expensive here. I I have to say I have been an Elliott uh, capo fan for a lot of years, and I know this one's somewhat heated debate out there, uh, and I can give you my reasoning behind this. Uh, but here's here's mine. It's an all hand built stainless steel uh, capo. More than anything, first of all, design cradle style capos for me. I always liked them. They're small. They get out of the way when I put it up here. 
I can actually get on the back side of them if I need to. I can, you know, get and play stuff over, and I'm not running into anything like a Kaiser or a, a Shub or anything with a way less mass, way less air. And more than anything, I can get it right up on the fret. So you're a cradle capo guy, right? <laughs> yeah, I was. I was giving examples of like, don't do this. Oh no, yeah, not for bluegrass. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot harder um, and, and fully adjustable. Now, the reason, uh, and Paige makes a great capo for this, an affordable option mm -hmm. for those benefits. Uh, the other reason I like these style capos a lot is they can be stored behind the nut when you're not using them. So less capo loss. And again, this also goes to my final point, which is everybody wants to know why somebody would spend $200 on a capo. Um, we already said we like it better. It, I actually hear the tone difference for myself. Um, and if I have a $25, $30 capo like what you held up, I guarantee you over time I will lose five or six of those. And with this, I'm not going to lose that capo near as often. Um, in fact, I have my first Elliott capo. I've had it over 25 years. It still functions the same way it did the day I bought it. So there's my value behind something that expensive. That's great. Um, I, I love the Elliot Capos too. I actually don't own one right now, believe it or not. Uh, I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I don't own one right now. Everyone would think that I have one, but I don't. Um, well, first, let me start by saying that the, uh, the vintage Capo market, not as attractive as the vintage guitar market. Do not recommend. <laughs> oh, you got to say, I, the one that you really got to go, let's go further back. If you haven't seen those, the spring one that actually uh, has the cup, the uh, cork cup and the cork on the top. Have you seen that one? I actually yeah. found a bunch of those uh, original vintage ones. If you ever see a vintage guitar and you see a little like oval shape in the back of the of the neck, you will know that somebody used this spring loaded one that, that clamped down. And the only thing that was protecting it was a piece of cork. And yeah, really bad. Really and the really cork bad. was gone. Yes. Um, I've been really enjoying um, these uh, cat cat eyes cat's eye capos, um, and uh, yeah, they're they're fairly new on the market. Um, but I've been playing this one a lot. They have a really interesting design in that they have this uh, sort of triangular shaped cradle, which means that as you tighten it, it centers itself on the guitar neck, um, which I find really interesting. I don't know, it just caught my there eye, and uh, and I've really been enjoying that. Um, it's not very often that an advancement is made in the world of capos. <laughs> it's fun to explore a new idea. I will also say that I really enjoy, um, in the Cat Eyes capo, that uh, they do do some um, custom modifications. So you can get them in, you can get them in steel, you can get them in brass, you can get a knurled knob like most capos have, or you can even get a die on the back, which is, you yeah. know, the blingy option, obviously. Um, cool. Those, I think, only run you about half as much as the Elliott Capo, and um, even half of that, a Capo that I played for a long time, is the Ultimate Capo, which is made by another guy named Elliott, no relation. Uh, I think this one's made in Oregon, and uh, it's just a chunky brass Capo that uh, you could run over with the truck, and uh, that's what appealed there you go you know to me about it way back when and i played them for a long time this one is decades old very good i don't i i've seen the cat size one not seen that other one so those are those are uh very very cool um again i just know i've seen these and uh you know they're definitely an old standard uh and oh, yeah. a lot of designs they definitely uh and if you're looking for uh the tony rice style capo uh that was actually a mckinney uh, and Elliot does make the actual McKinney reproduction ones. In fact, actually, the one I have on this guitar, since I have a Rice style guitar, I actually have one of the Tony Rice models, those limited edition ones. So, what number yes, do you I'm have? Yes, I'm a nerd. Oh, you never. I have the same serial number as I'll never my tell. favorite Tony Rice <laughs> album. <laughs> oh, I have really? my favorite album, and uh, yeah, I, I matched it with the serial number. Uh, what was the serial number? I can't remember what it was, but the album number or the album was the Cold on the Shoulder album, and it was the catalog number. And I was actually able to get the serial number to match for that. So that's so cool. I'm realizing now that you know, Double Odd 44, the Capo number 44 must have been fiercely fought over. <laughs> I know who has it. I know oh, who really? has it. That's who. That's where I got the idea for this one. One was from. Yes, I know exactly who has that one. Uh, so. That's so funny. 
I won't tell. I won't tell. Anyway. Um, yes, those tell. are my favorite capos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on. Uh, favorite strings. What are you using now for favorite your favorite strings? strings? Yeah, I'm a I'm I'm a simple man, uh, and I think it's because I change strings so often. Um, can you guess what I'm going to pull out? I, I'm betting you're an EJ17 person. The EJ17, but you buy them in bulk <laughs> because you're going to be changing strings so often. Look, there's not even that many left in there. <laughs> uh, no, I've I've tried I'm lots of so other things that I really enjoy, but. Um, you know, when I was gigging a lot more, you know, when you're playing, you know, 200 dates in a year or something, I find that yep. um, that uh, you end up changing strings, you know, every, what, two, maybe three shows even. You know, you might yeah. just burn through a set if it's, you know, sweaty out, it's the summertime. So, um, so yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't interested <laughs> in paying too much for my strings because I knew I was going to just have to pop another set on. And I've certainly heard that from sure. other bluegrass musicians, but... Uh, um, I don't know why, but that habit has stuck. I've stuck with the EJ-17. I was always that way, too. I've never been a coated string person. I, it sounds like you've not been. Yep. Um, I will say I'll, I'll get to this in, in my opinions, and I do have now. I finally have found a coated string that I really, really do like. But right. for me, and I don't know if you've ever tried these, this has been my go-to set for many, many years. It's gone through a few different name changes. Originally, this was called the Signature Bronze by GHS. Uh, it was a Lawrence Juber set, and then now called the Americana series. Um, this is my go-to set still to this day for I want the best tone, if I'm absolutely concerned about the tone of, uh, and, and again, my argument has always been on strings. A phosphor bronze set of strings in the same gauge is pretty much that from Everybody I know, this is where every comment warrior is going to go <laughs> crazy in here. But uh, a little known fact, almost every company until recently uh, was buying the same uh, formulated wire uh, from the same supplier and just doing their own slight variations on these gauges was the biggest difference unless they changed the actual... Uh, yeah, unless they change the actual uh, formulation of that metal, but a phosphor bronze or an 8020 bronze... Well, you, for the most part, until recently, was literally the same thing, uh, just slightly different. Now, what I liked about those strings was they were a, uh, a the core wire was plated with bronze, so you have a, instead of just plain steel, uh, you had a core wire, and that really made a difference for the high E and B for me and warmed it up just a hair, kind of taking away mm -hmm. some of that metallic twinge, just a hair. Not dramatically, and then for me, uh, the other thing that I always liked about GHS sets was, again, we talked about d d uh, gauges. They use a 36 and a 26 in the center, so slightly heavier core wire on those two center strings, and I could feel that in my right hand a little bit more so than the 35 that was done on the D string of the really? Diderio. So that was my, that was, those were my reasons for that particular set. Was it dramatic? Absolutely not. But it was, uh, to me, just a slight edge. Then came the XS. That has been, for me, the oh, really? first coated string that I have actually been a fan of. Um, to me, it sounds pretty much identical to the EJ-17, but I do see a dramatic amount of increased wear. And I put that on... Any guitar that I don't play or I'm not doing a session for, but a guitar that is going to be played every once, every two to three weeks uh, or longer so that I don't have to change them as, long, as often. Yeah, because otherwise you pick up that guitar, you know, for it's one time to shine in two months and you're like, all right, well, I'll change the strings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. So I've always been uh, a non-coated fan. Like I said, for me, it was putting, you put a coating on a string that's a standard string. It's got to deaden it up a little bit. I have uh -huh. to say, I don't know what they've done on the new X, uh, XSs, but it seems to be, I really personally can't tell much of a difference in the tone of the XS. Have you tried those yet? I haven't. You know, what What turned me off of, of coated strings, you know, 20 years ago was uh, them kind of like spider webbing on your hands. You know, they used to kind of like fall apart. Yep. You don't yep. have to tell me in the comments. I know it's not like that anymore, but, you know, that <laughs> it's a core memory. <laughs> I, love, I love that you tell them you don't have to tell me in the comments. They're going to tell you. They're going to. You know it. 
they're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, all right. Well, last one, last one. Uh, what about like uh, other things? You got like tuners or this and that. All right, uh, tuners. We should talk about tuners. I got my all-time favorite tuner, um, which I have various I have variations of this. The Peterson Strobo tuners, to me, again, this is kind of my ultimate uh, pick. I just, the clip-on is great. I also use one of their stage boxes. I think, for me, once I started using one of these, at first I was like, it can't be that much of a difference. You know, electronic tuner is an electronic tuner. Once I started using it on a regular basis and really got this as accurate as I possibly could, I have to say, I... I really don't find anything else to match it for myself. It's just I now am used to that kind of tuning. And it's not that I use it. I mean, I, I recognize that I'm out of tune most of the time. But <laughs> when I do get it in, it's so good with this. So uh, I'm a Strobo tuner fan. Um, but for a budget tuner, I like the D'Addario Eclipse tuners. They're just a basic one, big display, uh, affordable, usually around 15 bucks or so. That's probably my favorite. <clears throat> I agree with you on the strobe. Um, I just don't have mine because because I broke it. And I won't say how, but <laughs> user error. <laughs> no, that'll happen. That will happen. <laughs> but what I do have no, I... is this Super it. Snark, um, which is basically the most generic tuner you can have. I do want to point yeah. out that they're rechargeable now, and I don't know if that happened However many years ago, but I just found out about it, and I find that... I think it just was announced this year. Oh, really? I saw that. Okay. Yeah. I just assume I'm behind the times, but no, this was my emergency replacement. Yep. And it got you through? Yeah, it's still getting me through. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) It's it's a rechargeable Uh, thing. All right. uh, Favorite crazy uh, accessory that you just like, you know, this is this is probably one of the coolest products that, you know, that I have. It's not necessarily a necessity, but is something that you kind of just dig a whole bunch. What do you have right now that you're that falls in this wheelhouse? Well, I have this robot that plays my guitar. It's the um, I love those Dr. Robots. Thingamajig. <laughs> Dr. Thingamajig. <laughs> The doohickey thing with jig. That's a that's a callback to a joke that happened off camera. <laughs> that's the Doctor Herringbone. <laughs> the Doctor Herringbone tone traveler. He just he's just recognizing right now what it's like to work with the Chapmans and how we will ruin anything professional. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, the Tone Traveler. I, I am also a huge fan of this product. Uh, tell us what you like about it and uh, what it does for you. Well, let me let me start with what I don't like about it. <laughs> All right. I'm down with that, um, too. Unfortunately, you you can't really, like, work in the same room as it. It is It's louder <laughs> than you might imagine. So if you're hanging out, you know, like my guitar is like a foot away from me on this stand... I can't pop this on the guitar and then sit here and type an email. Um, You will get a headache. I've had the headache. I can tell you about the quality of the headache. (laughs) Um, But that being said, it does its job amazingly well. Um, I did a video on my channel where I did a test where I left it running for, I don't remember, maybe like eight hours. And um, I recorded the guitar the entire time to see if there was any change in the frequency band or in the volume. There was a drastic volume increase. Um, it was really, really interesting. And as it ran, um, and I sat here, you know, with earplugs in, um, I could actually hear the, the (laughs) overtones coming out of the guitar changing, right? You know, it started out and it was this very like boomy, muddy sound. By the time it was done, it had this really like bright, you know, clear, higher overtone sound, which I thought was really interesting too. If you've, if you've never hung out next to one for eight hours, you, you probably don't know that, but it happens. I did not do that. I can't believe you did, but uh, very good. <laughs> What's your experience with the Tone Traveler been like? Uh, I, I'm absolutely a big fan as well. I contacted these guys after I saw the very first video, and I was like, send me one. I want to check this out. 
Um, for those of you who do not know, it comes with a tablet. It is geared specifically to certain uh, to all the various different stringed instruments. Originally, it was only available for mandolin and guitar. They've now expanded to banjo. It comes with uh, vi all the violins, so bass, violin, viola, cello. Um, the advantage here is it's it's uh, it is actively generating the sounds of the open strings of that instrument into here. And we've all known about things that break in instruments. There's been various different ones from putting a guitar on your subwoofer to all these. My argument always was with that is you're breaking it into frequencies and movements that it's not intended to do. Again, mm -hmm. I may be wrong on this theory, but a subwoofer uh, doing 100 hertz or 80 hertz or 40 hertz, that's not a, a frequency that this was designed to do. So uh, to me, it was loosening up areas that weren't necessary. And with this, it's actually generated to the specific instrument that you're trying to open up. I have found it to be very successful. I think all of those were successful to some degree. This just seems to be much more targeted and accurate and I agree with you it is loud we have done we use it in the store all the time for instruments that were like man this is so close but boy it could be so much better we'll put it on the tone traveler uh, for a weekend see what it does and it definitely makes a difference yeah definitely the um uh the tablet too not, not only can you you know go to their their presets for like guitar and mandolin and this and that but on the very last page is also just you know, the chromatic series over however many octaves and you can just choose which tones yeah, you want. So if you lots. play your guitar in an alternate tuning or something, you can also use it, which is really neat. Or uh, I found this to be interesting too. I've seen a lot of us that have played and opened up guitars. When we do it at home, we tend to be in open positions, no capos, no uh, placements uh, there. And when we capo up to a B flat or a, a, a you know fourth fret B uh, space, the guitar seems to be not as open and resonant as it has been in the majority of the place where we played it in the open G. So I have found that also to be good to find those frequencies that would be in that range for that guitar and that That's cool. seemed to make a difference for me. So I agree with that idea, so I love that. All right, I have another really, really cool one that is not a standard uh, unit here. This is the Tone Guard for Dreadnoughts. Now every mandolin player out there has one of these. Uh, you know, you've seen it, you know it. Almost everybody, every mandolin player puts one of these big cages on the back of their mandolin. For those of you who have never seen one, all this really does is it goes on the back of the guitar like so. Um, you kind of squeeze it and spread it out just a little bit and it just sits there kind of creating a little bit of a space between you and the back of the guitar um, and separating it. And again, if this is something that you're just like, I'm not sure what kind of difference that's going to make. I'll tell you a real quick, easy test to do is take your guitar squeeze it up against, in my case, your enormous gut and smash it up against there and listen to that, you know, what is here. And it's, you're gonna notice it's gonna be stifled and then just take and put some separation between you and that. And you should hear a pretty dramatic uh, in, in volume increase as well as the low end and richness in there. Um, I really find this, uh, on newer guitars to be one of the easiest things. If I'm in a jam session, I, I, I find this to be a no-brainer in a jam session. Guitars are usually buried pretty easily. And so for me, a jam session, I can gain myself more volume and more tone. Uh, two, on a newer guitar that doesn't have as much presence as like a vintage uh, instrument, I definitely use it for that. Uh, I will tell you, I went on tour, uh, we used uh, in-ear monitors. My brothers on tour, I put it on the back of my uh, 1940 D18, and they all asked me to please take it off because it was so much louder in the monitors that uh, they were uncomfortable <laughs> with it. So I had to remove it, uh, but it definitely makes a difference, and it's not a super expensive thing, and, you know, just for the heck of it, get one. Is it a one-size-fits-all one, deal? It fits all dreadnoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it does squeeze a little bit. I. It, we tried to put it on an OM. It didn't work so well. So it was close, but not quite. It will fit on a grand auditorium, but they only make uh, the for guitar just the dreadnought size. Cool. They, well, we're the I'll only send ones. Send one to you. Play. This is going to be your. Yeah, this is. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Our guitars aren't loud enough already. We need them louder. I'm going to send one to you. Uh, your your next jam session. Everybody's going to go. Oh my God! I finally can hear Marcel. It's going to be great. 
<laughs> oh no, maybe maybe I don't need one. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, there's uh, some of our favorite accessories. Um, I hope you guys got a kick out of it. I know I had a, a good time talking about them. Um, I know there's a bunch of others. There's, you got other cool things. We're going to talk about this off camera. You probably have all kinds of cool accessories that I don't know anything about yet. I just, you know, I can't talk about that stuff on camera. It's secret. Okay, cool. Well, I'm down with that. If you're going to be that way. <laughs> there's there's reasons why he sounds the way he does that none of us are allowed to sound like. I got you. I see what you're <laughs> yeah, doing. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I turn my back to the stage. <laughs> uh, this is like the man. old Charlie Waller. Have you ever seen that bit? Charlie Waller used to have a bit where he would do a snare drum for the beginning of uh, uh, Under the Double Eagle. He would always start it out with a... And when they first did that, the band members would put a, uh, a, uh, a, a handkerchief over top of it so nobody could see how he was doing it. And it was a really big deal. Oh, I, just, That's good. I just gave away a total top secret story right there that nobody even cared about. So you're welcome. <laughs> anyway, I had a great time talking about accessories with you, Marcel. Again, if you have not checked out Lessons by Marcel or Lesson with Marcel, please do that. You got to check him out. He's a whole bunch of fun. And thanks again for uh, joining me. Thank you, Marcel, for joining us and talking about some of your favorite accessories. Uh, if you like that one, we have a, a cool video that I'd like you to check out. This was uh, a video all about picks and the difference between them. We did a blind test, a pick blind test. I think you'll get a kick out of that. The link will be right here in the screen. Check that out. Uh, and until next time, thank you all for being here. We'll see you all. Thank you. Adios. Bye-bye now. <laughs>